Hello and welcome to Tea Time. The reading room is open. I'm going to look at, in this short video, uh, what types of things have changed over the past 50, 60 years, and then try to figure out what it means to be conservative and um, how people believe they are living traditional lifestyles, considering the vast amount of change in virtually all aspects of life and mostly their embrace of change in virtually all aspects of life. Uh, so let's let's just try to f define what is conservative. What is conservatism? There we are. Uh, tr commitment to traditional values and ideals and with opposition to change or innovation, the holding of political views that favor free enterprise, private property ship, and social traditional ideals. Okay, so what are social traditional ideals? Our social traditional ideals. Emphasizes traditional, these are, that's not very clear. Social conservatism, monarchism. So I think we're going to come up with things like um, deference to authority, uh, religious morality. Um, I mean, some of this is more or less intuitive, but uh, not everybody intuits exactly the same. I mean, one has to be exposed to different ideas in order to have some understanding. You know, a person born into the world doesn't just understand everything naturally. They have to observe and see. Uh, little change from generation to generation. Traditional societies marked by particularistic as opposed to universalistic. Okay, well, that's still not too specific. Well, let's just kind of assume that there are behavior. Let, let's, let's just think about some behaviors. So uh, marriage rates from 1950 to present. So uh, in 1950, 82% of the female population was married. And by 2000, it had declined to 62%. Let's look at what's happened even more recently. So marriage has declined and until 2020. Marriage has been more or less on a steady decline over the past 50 years. Kind of reached a high point here at the end of World War II and divorce has been on the rise. I mean, that's, that's no surprise. That's kind of well known. 68% in 1900 up to 92%. Earlier 20th century, the records weren't kept very well, but post-World War II records keeping became kind of the norm. And so there's a change right in itself, just from the 1800s to the 1900s, records being kept. So that's, that's a change. Um, and I think there's a lot of, there's net good change, you know, and maybe there's net, net negative, but keeping records and having, you know, piles and stores of papers and online databases helps to understand things, you know, so there's a, there's a change in itself, and just, you know, having ID cards, there's a change, and so, uh, like a blanket resistance to change maybe is, is not such a good thing, uh, considering that change, change can also be positive. Uh, I personally think that a rising divorce rate is not a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, I suppose, you know, if somebody's trapped in a terrible marriage, then that, that Maybe sometimes it's best to get divorced, but um, this is what other people are doing. It's not what I'm doing, but that is a social change that, like, it's not for me, but I can't change what other people do. Yeah. So there is one change, and I, I suspect that's one of the things that conservatives aren't really in favor for. But, yeah, you see conservative leaders in the, in the political field have been divorced, and they've had mistresses, and, all, you know, there's the head of the Republican Party has been divorced several times, so I don't know if that's... That's really a thing anymore. So let's look at interracial marriage rates. History. And of course, we're going to see an incline, right? And a big part of this was it was illegal in the 60s, you know? And so, again, there, there's a... There, change is kind of unavoidable, you know? Like, uh, from, from the 1800s to the 1900s, women gained the right to vote, you know? Alcohol became illegal in the 1920s, then legal again in the 1930s. There's wars, those precipitate change. Obviously, you got income tax coming in. 
in order to fund the military, there is a change. Um, and I'll look at tax rates in a moment, but um, laws change, and you know some of them cause more difficulties for people, and some of them are you know intended to create more freedoms and represent fairness more, like the fact that people of different races can get married. That's that's probably a, a good thing. You know, if somebody thinks that's a bad thing, well then maybe that's the kind of change that uh, they shouldn't oppose. You know, so in 1970 it was what. 310,000, and I want to say it's like 1 in 6 percent of marriages interracial uh, 2020. 5 percent in the 1950s to of public approval went from 5 percent in the 1950s to 94 percent in the 2021. Uh, percent, the share of, this is from Pew, Pew's a reputable source of statistics to share recently married blacks with a spouse of a different race and this is just black people marrying a different race you know that doesn't include other interracial marriages from five percent to eighteen percent in 2015 and so yeah it's, it's about one in six and it might be a little higher if we took into account all of the different interracial marriages and of course you know with the supreme court Decision legalizing gay marriage. There's another change. I, I assume that's one of the changes that quote unquote conservatives oppose. But how about um, tax tax rates? Tax rates history. You know, this is not the type of change that conservatives dislike. Well, uh, post World War II, you see 94 percent tax for the the highest income, and you see that that stuck around until Reagan, um, till the Reagan administration, and then it slowly declined to 40% tax rate, roughly for those above $200,000. Uh, so this is some change that conservatives got behind. So the idea that it's that it's merely like a resistance to change is, is kind of out the window, considering that. Well, how about let's look at technology, technology changes uh, 1950 to present. I know that even conservatives don't sit around and, you know, well, some of them would rather live it with this technology, maybe because they could fix it themselves. But generally speaking, conservatives and liberals and people across the political spectrum um, would rather not live in the era of the 1900s, but rather they've embraced mobile devices and satellite technologies and things like that. Uh, and I've even heard some conser you know, the conservatives talking about how uh, America is not as competitive because it's not innovating and filing patents and producing microchips and things, uh, when it, whereas it was more competitive, like it was the source of more innovation in the mid-20th mid century. And that's mostly just gone to like app developing and more cloud-based services and things recently. Uh, so again, there, there, there kind of undermines the whole idea that conservatism is, is like a total resistance to change because it seems to kind of support some change and then not others. But then how do we decide? You know, um, and when there isn't much there's not much ideology even spoken. It's just kind of like a feeling as far as I can see. Well, let's look at um, S&P 500 growth chart history. Again, uh, certainly a type of change that conservatives and liberals alike have enjoyed, you know, that the S&P has grown. Oh, look at those tiny, pathetic levels down there in 1960s and 1970s. Well, maybe the, yes, these things are all kind of re related, that the economy is, you know, growing because of more inclusion, you know. And so maybe we can't just, like, split the the society and the economy so easily, you know. Maybe, maybe like... Um, one thing that, you know, one change that one group likes, you know, comes with other changes maybe they don't like, you know, like maybe there are trade-offs, right? Whereas if we want to just like piddle around with the S&P being at the $10 level or whatever, uh, then sure, I, I guess, you know, they can scale back all of those social and other changes that have happened. 
and they can go back to paying 90% on their highest incomes too. But I don't think that's the kind of change that they resist. Right? Uh, so let's see, gun sales, gun sales uh, chart history, because again, conservatives are, um, you know, the ones who like the guns, right? Guns sold per month. Well, the if this is guns sold per month, the number sold per month has been steadily increasing. That's change. And then if the number if they're just month after month after month, then the total volume of guns in the population is increasing, and, and that's change. And and so I think again we're kind of undermining the thesis that conservatives resist change because well it, here are just more guns in society, and that that's you know a good thing, right? Uh, and we can see that they're even at growing, they're being sold at an increasing rate. And then let's look at crime rate history. And I've done other videos about how um, crime totals and rates are, are different. They can be kind of manipulated to give a different picture. But here's a decline in the rate. And it's been a steady decline in the rate of violent crime. Uh, from the mid 90s to present and you can see it's been a there was a precipitous decline in the 90s with three strikes law you know and that's changed that was a that was a democrat led change the three strikes laws the mandatory minimums or i would even say that's bipartisan bill clinton was you know a, a, a dixie crap basically and so I, I suspect that that's the type of change that conservatives now are are, are pushing for you know more law and order more this and that, and and sure, I, I you know, I, I see the value in a lot of that argument, but um, that has changed, you know. And if we come to this state in history, you know, this point, and then want to change it back to something else, well, then that itself is change. And so, there is this kind of um, this self-contradictory sense, uh, and it it actually doesn't make sense that somebody would be resistant to change because. Well, I mean, let's look at birth, birth, birth rates, uh, history. You know, people's lives change all the time. Like each one of these births represents a change in uh, an individual's life, right? And a change in the population, right? And so, and as the last I heard, you know, the the conservatives love to see more babies. Uh, let's look at population over time. Population growth history. Well, and here's just more change. And so, it, and this is type, the type of change that's kind of unavoidable. You know, here, so here's world population growth. Well, well, that's obviously not very important to, you know, conservatives in, in any specific country because they aren't too concerned about the, the world. You know, it's, it's like, that's a, it's a newfangled idea, the world. Uh, so let's look at U.S., you know, because that's, that's like the, the focus there for these outspoken folks. Uh, so we've got percent population change from previous decade. So that the percent population change from the previous decade is going down, I suppose, but the U.S. population total is going up. Uh, and so there is more change, you know. And so, yeah, in the, in the 60s, right, it was like 200-some million, less than 200 million, and we're heading towards 400 million over 100 years. So it's a doubling over 100 years. And, um, you know, you can't both have more births and uh, higher economic activity and less competition or uh, less population. And in a larger population within the same limited territory, there's, there's going to be a lot more interaction, you know, like the, not everybody can live out in the, in the woods, you know, there's going to be more city type of ideas. And as telecommunications spans a you know, nationwide market, and there's going to be exchange of ideas. So let's look at mobile phone adoption curve USA. Smartphone penetration market. So, uh, you know, it's pretty much everybody now. You had a, a decent curve from 2008, starting 2005, and then you got some exponential growth. Uh, so then by 2016, the laggards had been joining. This is a technology adoption curve. There are innovators, early joiners, middle of the road people, late majority and laggards. It's logistic growth. And I, I assume that, you know, by 
oh, you can see it's almost 100% by 2020. So 2016 in the previous graph, the laggards, that went up to the laggards. So from 2016 to 2020 even, that's, that's pretty much everybody. And, you know, that, that made a bump in the stock prices. And sure, there's all sorts of downsides as far as people having new technology in their pocket. Uh, but you can't have um, skyrocketing profits and, you know, the FANGs and on the NYSE or NASDAQ or the S&P or whatever group of companies, you know, you can't have Fortune 500 companies constantly growing and also say that, well, we don't like change because that, that's a contradictory statement. And so I, I'm, I'm just a little bit confused. And, and so... Uh, maybe what we're looking at here is like social controls? I, I don't know. Like, uh, is, this, is this like a mind control thing? That, or, or it, you know, I'm kind of struggling for what conservatism means. Right. Uh, let's see. Changing views among conservatives. And we can even say that uh, conservatives probably change their views, right? Uh, I think that in the mid-20th century, the majority of states that vote conservative now once voted liberal. And so the, or the two parties flip-flopped in the mid-20th century. And so we can see that, you know, there's even change within the group of people who... Uh, say they resist change. And so this is a really interesting sort of question, is which is contradicted in, the, in data. And of course, you know, that, that's like where people love to say, well, those things aren't related. The, the graph and the, my beliefs aren't related to your graphs, you know, and like mathematics is just for some stuffy old bunch of pocket protector wear and calculator geeks. But they sure do help to demonstrate that well, what people say they believe, it sometimes doesn't really look like that's what they actually believe. You know, I, I, I guess if, if an individual wants to like live on the same street, then even their house decays, you know, like the tree grows. Let's, let's look at tree, tree growth. Tree growth, 1950 to present. I swear those trees grow and, and the grass grows. They, you know, they spend how much gasoline mowing their lawns, you know, like if change were avoidable, here's biomass growth. If change were avoidable, then, um, you know, I guess it would be maybe a, a an ideology or a philosophy that, that I could understand. But it's like uh, the house needs to be kept up, you know, and, and things decay, right? And so like back in see, Boltzmann's time, Boltzmann uh, Entropy Scientific Community rejected that idea. So just before Boltzmann committed suicide, he introduced this idea of um, entropy, and also he was an advocate for atomic theory. You know, just like, uh, well, the world was, the, the Earth... The sun revolved around the earth before um, the Catholic Church said that it didn't. And, you know, smoking was was healthy before the 1950s or 1990s or whatever. You know, there there wasn't there weren't atoms before the early 1900s. You know, that so when the scientific community decided that well they must exist, that, you know, that's when they that's when they became real. And the same thing happened with Boltzmann that he um, he got rejected from his. Uh, from his group of scientists who just couldn't even believe that there's such a silly thing as, as entropy existed, you know? Um, so they were resistant to change, you know, because it changed their model. But they ended up being wrong. And then on his tombstone, there is a K log W, that's what that's on his tombstone. So they, they all voted against him. Uh, he, so he's like the smartest man alive, basically, among those respectable weirdos. And um, they just couldn't, couldn't accept that he had figured something out. And so he went and, he went and killed himself, um, which is not a good thing. But uh, I, I wonder, 
you know, like then they then the scientific community accepted his idea thereafter, and it's true, it's just scientific fact. And he was uh, smart enough to figure this out, but they just couldn't believe it. Oh, it's something as silly as entropy. What do you mean it trends toward disorder? That's that's ridiculous, you know, because like their vision of I don't know purity and order and things were askew from reality, you know. And maybe they were like too proud to admit that. Well, here's this this goofy looking guy. Can you imagine like that guy, that guy right there got the best of me, right? Um, but sure enough, he he figured it out. And they would not accept it. And so he uh, took his own life. And then the, shortly thereafter, you know, he, his equation became the second law of thermodynamics. Right? And so um, this, this tendency to reject change happens all over the place. But uh, decay, is, um, decay is unavoidable. Right? So decay, it's like a tooth decay, that's what we get here. When you, when you type that, you get tooth decay. Tooth decay is unavoidable. Well, not exactly, but uh, decay is unavoidable plus entropy. Right, so a resistance to change, you know, like, yeah, I, I guess, you know, we, we would rather have order, and it is rather frustrating that the system trends toward disorder over time. And I think that a lot of that is, is just failure to keep up the system when it comes to a lot of these things. But like physical systems, you know, uh, trend toward disorder, right? And um, it, it threatens, uh, you know, it, it's an uncomfortable thing, right? So to try to resist that type of change, well, I, I guess that's rational. But um, still, you know, if we look around uh, from history, I, I don't think anybody would really want to live through history so much. I, I don't think that uh, the food was so good and the medicine was so good and the, let's see, medi medical changes 1950 to present. You know, so really, uh, look at this vaccine. Great, they had a vaccine. You know, look at this guy here. That's, that's not exactly something that too many people would be comfortable with. You know, like that his, look at that shot behind him there. It's not like hygienic or something. Um, you know, not so long ago, they didn't even know that there were bacteria. And so was it, was it a change in reality? No. It, you know, so maybe, you know, we got different kinds of change here. And sure, that like the changes that lead to less orderly thinking and more delusional type of behavior or like less productive type of behavior, I guess that, that's rational to avoid those changes. But look at all these great changes. You know, like um, adult live donor liver transplant. You know, how many people's lives are saved by a circadian clock, right? So just discovering things, cholesterol mechanism, DNA sequencing techniques, you know? So if people were universally opposed to change, we would never have anything. We would, we would just still be a bunch of, like, cave people who eat our food raw, you know. And so this, uh, this predisposition toward avoiding change is just really kind of confusing. And maybe there are trade-offs. You know, maybe uh, repressive dictatorships around the world don't make great scientific discoveries in part because they... Um, repress speech and thought and maybe there are trade-offs where if you want to have um, people who are like let's see finding herpes Achilles heel viral peptides critical to natural HIV control or uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine if that's your thing or how the brain senses infection the origin of breast cancer the microbiome and cancer immunotherapy you know, like any of these things. These are just milestone events per year in medical science. And maybe, um, like in Boltzmann's time, like he, he was obviously an outcast and a pariah for, no, for understanding that things were just as they are. Just like Galileo got put in prison for saying that the Earth revolved around the sun. That was just so shocking and it was just so unruly that they put him in prison. And so maybe... Um, some of these other like less less attractive types of 
freedoms and changes and things are just part and parcel of, of having a society that promotes and fosters and has you know creates a suitable environment for um, changes in the way that people perceive the actual world you know like maybe scientific discovery and innovation really cannot happen so much when there is such rigid thinking and, and people aren't really allowed to um, change their views you know like to go from thinking that the flu was some sort of frog and somebody you know or like a, a black bile or yellow bile and some you know it, like there's a back in the middle ages or whatever there was all sorts of superstitions people used leeches and bloodletting and all sorts of different weird things happen uh, and it required the, those were those are spiritual ideas they you know they were the beliefs of the time and it, in order to grow and adapt and have better things then people not only have to change their like mechanisms for manipulating elements and machines but also that requires a change in the way they think about things and view the world and you know maybe these things are all related uh, coincidentally the people who resist change so much don't seem to be um, great scientists, you know, but they sure do benefit from all the sciences. So let's look at um, human lifespan history. And we're going to see increasing. Again, change. There's change, and that's a change that just about everybody is going to enjoy, you know. Look at all, look at that great change. Like back in the mid 1800s, you're going to live 40 to 50 years. 40 to 50 years. The highest reported life expectancy in 1840 was like 45 years. And then we cracked 50, the highest expected life, life expectancy in the national population. Like 52 in 1860. And it got above 60 in 1900. So as scientific progress increased and as all of those newfangled ideas and skateboards and <laughs> electronic music and you know whatever whatever those uh, whatever bothers people as those things increased in popularity so too has life expectancy increased uh, and so maybe you, know, you can't have one without the other and sure there can be some tweaking and refining and you know little things but um, probably not going to have such luck in controlling what everybody does, you know, and I think that's also, th so it would be a change in the way that governments function and the way that people view society that they would think they can control what everybody else does. That's, that's never been a thing that people haven't been able to think you know, among their own people, at least, you know, like they'll go away from the Lord's manor and, and say th nasty things about him in their little ramshackle huts. Uh, and, you know, they'll practice whatever they want in private, whilst, you know, maybe they have to say this or that in public, but what's the point of that? What's the point of that? You know, because up until this point, up, up until now, you know, that's never worked out. And so change seems to be one of the few unavoidable things on this planet. And that's a T. Reading room is closed.